Hi, everyone. I'm Heidi Hess, uh, one of the co-directors of Credo Action, and I'm so glad to have everyone here in the Credo office with me and everyone on Facebook uh, to talk with Michael Waldman, the president of the Brennan Center. Um, at its core, the Brennan Center protects our democracy. It fights for voting rights, fair representation, the integrity of our courts, and campaign fin finance reform. It works to end mass incarceration and gerrymandering and to defend our civil liberties against authoritarian and xenophobic policies and politicians. Um, at Credo, the action team has gotten to work with the Brennan Center to fight for automatic voter registration, to fight against gerrymandering, and Credo donations um, has given uh, more than $340,000 to the Brennan Center. So we're super grateful to be supporters in the work they do on, in so many ways. Um, Michael's led the Brennan Center's work since 2005, and today, since we're less than 20 days before the midterms, seemed like a good time to talk about voting rights, um, where there's a lot to fight, but also a lot of good news. Uh, so first question, actually stepping back a little bit, um, is voting a right or a privilege? It's a great question. First of all, let me start by saying thank you to you, so to, to Credo. Uh, and to the members of the Credo community around the country who've supported our work. It's made a huge difference in what you all do, not only as a company, as an organization, but in fighting for change and fighting for what we all believe in is really incredibly important. And we're, we're thrilled to be able to work with you and partner with you. I think the right to vote is a right. It is not a privilege. It is central to what any democracy means. Mm -hmm. It is never easy. You should might think that, uh, well, shouldn't it all be settled by now? It, it, the, there's a fight to vote that's required to make mm -hmm. that right to vote meaningful. But uh, if me being an American means anything, having that say in our government and our self determination is is central to it. You know, the, the country was started when they did the Declaration of Independence when Thomas Jefferson wrote the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, they didn't just break with Great Britain. They said that government is legitimate only if it has the consent of the governed. Mm -hmm. And yes, they were hypocrites. Yes, they didn't mean it. Most people certainly couldn't vote, let alone so many who were enslaved. But that idea is yep. the start of the country. And so, to my mind, anybody who challenges that right to vote uh, is challenging what it means to be an American. And it is, by the way, in the Constitution at this point many times. And we'll stay. We'll stay. We need to enforce it we and do. make it real. Right. Um, so we know that Republicans are doing lots of things to undermine voting rights. And before we sort of talk about those in specific, uh, why is it important to them to suppress the vote? Why does it, what, what do they get? You know, I, I have a hard time understanding how someone can wake up in, in the morning and say, what can I do today to make it so other people can't vote? Mm -hmm. And y'all have a really good day if I succeed. Right. But there are a lot of people who are doing that. Uh, the country's changing. The uh, demographic base of the country is changing. And that's been the way it's been throughout its history. And whenever there's this kind of change, and whenever people who are locked out want to seat at the table, want to make their voice heard, uh, very often the way the people who have the power respond is by trying to choke off their right to vote, make it harder to vote. And as you know, in the last decade or so, mm -hmm. uh, we now have 23 states, half the country, yep. that have made it harder to vote for the first time since the Jim Crow era. And, right. and those voting changes do hit disproportionately communities of color, mm -hmm. young people, poor people, students, right. uh, they're not accidental. They're really targeted very surgically uh, to make it harder for those voices to be heard. Yep. Those voices might not agree with the it, policies it, it's, that it's, they're. It, you know, I think a lot of it sort of started uh, in that crazy year of 2000 where there was a presidential election where there was basically a tie and it all came down to one state, Florida, where there was this mm -hmm. month-long recount and people really realized yep. Holy cow! You can really win by suppressing the other side's vote, or by turning out your vote. And uh, we saw a lot of lies, a lot of naked uh, political power grabs mm -hmm. dressed up in principle uh, ever since. Yeah, and I think certainly as the rising majority is more people of color and women and young people, the groups that Republican policies often disadvantage and attack the most, makes sense that they want to. Right. Try right. to keep those people from being able to have a voice. Um, 
All right, so now some specifics. Um, I think, you know, we all sort of know about some of the things. I think it would be great to sort of just get the, the bucket of, of things that they do that keep folks from being able to vote. So what are the things that Republicans do that undermine well, it, you know, it's a lot of different things. Right. It's not only one thing. You'll hear a lot of people talk about voter ID yep. as sort of the, 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 the easiest thing mm -hmm. to remember or understand. And uh, I don't think it's wrong for people. Only eligible people should be able to vote and only eligible citizens should do it, but, but every eligible citizen yep. should do it. There's all kinds of ways for people to be identified. These new harsh voter ID laws are carefully crafted mm -hmm. to be ones that a lot of people don't have. About 11% of eligible voters in the United States just don't have a driver's license mm -hmm. or a similar government ID. And instead of making it so everybody has one of those IDs or, or broadening it out, uh, instead what you have is laws like in Texas where um, they passed a very harsh restrictive law this it's sort of famous because it was one that said you cannot oh. use your University of Texas ID right. as a I government ID, but you can use your, your concealed, concealed carry government <laughs> permit. You know, right. hmm. Hmm. what a coincidence! How, how did that happen? Um, and you know, a lot of times people say, "Well, there's a lot of reasons." We have the lowest voter participation rate of any democracy right. still have for years. There's a lot of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. May gee, maybe these laws are stopping aren't really stopping people who want to participate and want to vote anyway you know maybe maybe it's all a theoretical problem well in texas a federal court found that the second that law was implemented mm -hmm. six hundred and eight thousand registered voters actual registered voters lost their right to vote at that moment were disenfranchised um, it was a more complete disenfranchisement than bull connor could have ever dreamed mm -hmm. up you know in the south mm -hmm. and uh, it, happily, in that case, the Brennan Center and other voting rights groups sued mm -hmm. with the Justice Department on our side for yeah. most of the time right? and actually uh, managed to block the worst parts of that law. But that's the kind of, so that's voter ID mm -hmm. laws. Then this year, there really aren't a lot of new voter ID laws. Yep. The biggest new threat or the, the, the kind of the most, the new mischievous, mm. malevolent strategy has to do with voter purges. Yep. Um, who's on the list mm -hmm. and you know the voting rolls are sort of ramshackle in a lot of ways yeah. and there's a lot of errors on them and you want to make sure the lists are cleaned up but what you've seen in recent years is a surge in purges of people being kicked off the rolls often not being told it's happening maybe they show up on election day and hey my name's not there mm -hmm. and uh, disproportionately people of color same groups being hit ho over and over and one clue that this is not just, you know, bureaucrats going to bureaucrat, you know, is uh, the Supreme Court in 2013 gutted the Voting Rights Act, which right. was the great civil rights law mm -hmm. that Dr. King fought for and, and John Lewis and the other civil rights uh, heroes. They gutted the Voting Rights Act. They said, oh, no, no, this isn't a problem anymore. Right. Well, we're not racist. We're not racist. Yeah. The South is different. Done. The country is different. Mm -hmm. um, and if you remember, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg had a sort of legendary scorching dissent. That was where she became notorious yep. RPG. <laughs> and she said, that, that's like standing in a rainstorm. That's right. Holding an umbrella and not getting wet and deciding, therefore, well, you don't need an umbrella. You're not getting wet. You know, so yep. who, what's going to happen? Well, ever since that ruling, there's been, NBC News described it, uh, working off a study that the Brennan Center did, mm -hmm. there's been a frenzy of voter purges yep. in these states that used to be covered by the Voting Rights Act, mm -hmm. including Georgia. Right, right. Where there's a lot going on that we're all oh my gosh. paying attention to <laughs> right. right now. And the, I mean, just for a second on Georgia, the exact match, I don't know if people have you know been paying attention, right? So there's over 50,000 voter registrations that Secretary of State and gubernatorial candidate Kemp <laughs> is holding. Another coincidence. Another coincidence is holding and not letting, not processing without giving people a chance to fix uh, based on an exact ID match. And, it, and that's not quite voter ID. Right. It's, it's that's, that's something that is another thing that's been, you know, pushed uh, for a while. It's basically disenfranchisement by typo. If there's any change, yeah. any dis 
distinction between uh, you know your ID and what's in the what's in the record. So you might have a, a name with a hyphen missing mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that, or a misspelling. There's all kinds of misspellings. Mm -hmm. um, you're deemed not to be eligible to vote. Maybe you're really committing voter fraud or something like that. And interestingly, this was declared illegal and unconstitutional in, in a lot of states all over the country, but but not Georgia. And uh, so Georgia's legislature just passed this law uh, in 2017. And it's, it's an, a no match, no vote, sort of an exact match. Mm -hmm. And think again of who that affects. Who changes their name? Women who get right. married. Whose names get misspelled? Uh, people from immigrant groups. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just a very common thing. So that of these 53,000 applications to be registered to vote that are sitting on a desk, mm -hmm. a very big desk, <laughs> in Brian Kemp's office, right. uh, the Associated Press calculated yeah. that although about 32 percent of people living in Georgia are African American, 70 percent of these blocked voter registrations mm. are from black voters. Mm. Uh, another, another, the coincidences pile up, shocking. but it, it's, it, is, it is outrageous. Right. And Brian Kemp, um, nobody should suppress the vote. Nobody. But you really shouldn't do it when you're going to be the one to benefit from it. Right. Um, I want to circle back to one thing before we, before we talk about some good news. Um, I think there's a way that even folks who are watching on Facebook now or folks who, you know, we talk to about um, protecting the right to vote, I think there can be a way sometimes with voter ID, even with voter purges, that there's, even though we think about voting as a right, we have this like kernel inside that like starts leaning toward privilege mm -hmm. and where even, even people who really would fiercely defend voting rights might say things like, well, I mean, you know, if you can't even just go get an ID to go vote, like you must, I mean, it's, come on, like if you don't, you got to care about it or, well, if you don't care enough to vote every election, right. maybe you should get purged. So I, I guess I'm curious sort of how you think about responding to that or, or if there's a way that you think about talking about that uh, with folks. Because I do think it's something that sort of exists even in sort of liberal and progressive sort of under the surface sometimes. I think it's good to you know, surface I've, it I've, and talk about it. I think that's, that's very wise, and I think we do have to remember that, that, that simply crying voter suppression doesn't really persuade people always, you know, who, who say, well, it really hasn't been ever hard for me to vote. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't have to wait three hours in line to vote. That's part of the answer is it really falls on different people, yeah. and we just have to understand that, uh, as I mentioned, one out of ten people don't have a driver's license now or another government ID. Now, I, I couldn't imagine how to get through life that way. I, I had to show my driver's license to get into the office building that we're in. Right. Uh, that's, you know, that's how m so many people live, but there are just a lot of Americans who have every right to participate who don't. Right. Um, and uh, it, it, well, these things are all bound up in sort of notions of of who's deserving to participate, but when somebody's got uh, no car, it's not so easy to get over to the government office to go take a bus, three bus rides to go right. get your ID. If you don't have your birth certificate, because of all the reasons people don't have their birth certificate, it's kind of a pain and expensive yep. too to have to go fish it out. Um, th some of the barriers are more, and especially for the poor, are more meaningful than we realize. We had a, in one of the yeah. people in the Texas lawsuit uh, against that state's mm -hmm. voter suppression law. Um, she, she had grown up in Mississippi. She remembered paying, helping her grandmother count out the change to pay the poll tax right. when she was growing up. She moved to Detroit and Chicago, was sort of the great migration, mm -hmm. African American woman. To, you know, very common story. She went to college. She voted her whole, and then wound up retiring to Texas. And she voted her whole adult life, and then suddenly di didn't have the right to vote anymore because she didn't have the right paperwork. And we said to her in her testimony, uh, she lived on Social Security and nothing else. And we said to her, well, why don't you just spend the money and get your birth certificate? And she said, well, I have to feed my family, and you can't eat a birth certificate. 
she was somebody who wanted to vote. She yeah. wasn't irresponsible, but she had to put her priorities where they mattered. And I think for a lot of people, uh, even the most, what looks to a lot of us like a minor barrier could be pretty significant. But I think it's also really important for us to always remember that we're all one country, we're all one people, and we all have an e equal right, right to participate. And when you when you frame it in your in our own minds, not about sort of individual gumption of like, you get, there's some like uh, character building value right. in standing online to vote, but that in fact, if we take seriously what a democracy is, then we all should have an equal vote v right to participate and be heard, yeah. and we shouldn't be erecting barriers to that. Right. But then everybody has a I, I would I put some of the blame on people who don't vote. They should they should vote. We all need to take responsibility for the country we live in. Yes, yes, we do. Especially now. As, <laughs> always, but especially, especially now. Especially now. Um, so let's talk about what how we push back and what's going on that's good because there is some. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, Florida is big in my mind, but I think there's a lot of other things. So you could start with that or so get to that, whichever works for you. It, in the middle of all the craziness and all the partisanship and the Republican legislatures especially mm -hmm. trying to suppress the vote and the risks to election security of hacking by Russia and yep. others, which we haven't even talked about right. yet, it's on the list, all but, the know. kind of bad science fiction stuff that's right. going on, you would think it might all be dire. But actually, there's some very, very encouraging news, and, and Credo has been a part of this. There's a citizen movement in response to all this. People mm -hmm. are really angry. They actually understand how important our democracy is right now. And there's a pushback. And so even in the middle of all the nonsense, there's an unprecedented, at least in recent years, amount of progress happening or possible progress. Yep. So start with Florida. And the map of green states uh, is uh, states that have actually had expansions of voting rights or expansions of their voting laws or things that made it easier to vote or, mm -hmm. or improvements of democracy, even while all the, all the uh, you know, kind of racist nonsense is happening. Right. One of the most exciting possibilities this year is in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, felony disenfranchisement is something that is a legacy of the Jim Crow era. It actually goes back to the early 1900s when they passed the laws in a bunch of different ways to make it harder for the former slaves to vote. Mm -hmm. And in Florida, there's been progress all over the country in reforming and loosening those yep. laws to restore the right to vote to people who've done their time or rejoined the community or whatever it is. Florida is one of three states where you are banned from voting for a lifetime mm -hmm. if you have a felony conviction, even if it's drug possession when you're 18 years old. Yep. That's it for the rest of your life. It's 1.4 million people who are otherwise eligible voters in Florida, and one out of four black men there yep. can't vote. And there's a ballot measure that uh, is going to be considered in a few weeks, and it's <laughs> it's exciting, and it's a nobody should be under any illusions. It's really tough. Yep. You need 60 percent of the vote, and I'll be honest, I was quite concerned that it would be really hard in a year like this to get 60 percent of the vote to restore the right to vote to not everybody but almost all the people who are barred from voting and it's doing really well yeah the, uh, it's in the polls public polls private polls it's above 70 percent it's not partisan it, it's sort of a left-right thing uh, I, don't, I hope I don't blow the circuits out at credo by pointing out that the Koch brothers came out for it <laughs> Um, the Freedom Partners. You know, every once in a while, wait, yeah. a broken clock is well, right that, twice that, a day. That or something. doesn't work is with a digital clock, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. Something no, like so, that. And they work on criminal justice reform, right. and this is sort of part of part of that, uh, part of what they do. Um, but um, you know, one of the things that's very inspiring is that a lot of formerly incarcerated people are going door to door, yeah. saying, "Give me my right to vote, please. Yes. I really want to do it." Right. And, they're leading the campaign. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Uh, you know, fingers crossed and whatever other uh, totems we can come up with, um, but there's a real movement for it, and I think there's a good chance, you know, who knows, people, this, this touches on a lot of people's primal fears, and you never know how things are going to go on criminal justice-related issues, but it seems like there's positive momentum there. Yep, yep. And, and again, so, back to the idea that it's a right. 
It's a right. right? Yeah. It's and not a privilege. It's not wielded as punishment or reward. Well, if you think about in it, that what, way. if someone has a uh, First Amendment right to speak or, or religious freedom, um, they may have it deprived while they're in prison, and people could debate whether prison right. is a good thing or not, but that's, you know, most, most people don't have a problem with that happening in prison, but you don't say, well, you were in prison 20 years ago, you don't have the right to attend the church of your choice right. or, or speak exactly. out. It wasn't, a, it's no longer a right. Yep. And, you know, the, the right to vote is in the 14th Amendment, it's in the 15th Amendment, it's in the 19th Amendment, it is there in the Constitution, and it's got to be in our hearts as well. Yep. And Florida is only one green state there. Right. Um, it, it's, it, there's, there's a lot of other positive things that are happening. Again, not by and large, not not surprisingly, not driven by politicians, uh, even by progressive politicians, but by people. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, gerrymandering yep. is something people are more and more familiar with. Uh, it is the practice where politicians draw the lines of the legislative districts to benefit themselves or benefit their political party, mm -hmm. and it makes the elections really genuinely rigged in so many ways. Yep. Uh, not competitive, not hearing people's voices, cutting, you know, racially, racially hurtful, cutting out, again, new rising yep. communities. And the courts, we had hoped, were going to do something big this year on it, and they punted, they decided mm -hmm. not to, and with Kavanaugh on the court, it's not really, uh, nobody's under a lot of illusions about that. Yep. So voters took it into their own hands, and in five states, there's ballot measures this November for redistricting reform. Mm -hmm. Four of them, it's to create a nonpartisan yep. redistricting commission like there is in California, like there is in Arizona, uh, like Governor Kasich has pushed through in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Again, Democrats like to gerrymander too when they get a chance, and so it's this is one that's not quite as left-right uh -huh. as, yep. and uh, it, like in Michigan, all the politicians, the party, leaders in the Democratic Party told people, oh, no, no, it's too, it's not worth the effort, it's not worth the money. So people, a real citizen movement, they were standing on the side of the road holding up signs, you know, honk if you hate gerrymandering, and they blew through the petition requirements and awesome. think there's a good chance it's going to pass. And then automatic voter registration, right. which which Credo has been so active in, that's on the ballot in Michigan, too. And, and 13 states now have enacted that and the District of Columbia over the last few years. So there's People are, people are waking up to this. And can you just explain what automatic voter registration is, in Abs case folks don't know? Absolutely. Okay. So we are pretty much the only major democracy that says, and we kind of all take this for granted, oh, you have to register yourself. If you move, you fall off the rolls. Mm -hmm. uh, if you change your name, you fall off the rolls, whatever it is. And so it's actually a significant barrier yeah. to people participating and if you just change the paradigm so that right. the government's risk by if you're a citizen if you're eligible to vote you're on the rolls you, vote. you get to vote yep. um, that would add 50 million people to the rolls permanently and it would be better for election security too and so uh, starting in Oregon and then in California and now everywhere from Alaska to Illinois to most recently New Jersey and uh, West Virginia, a whole bunch of interesting places have a version of automatic mm -hmm. registration where basically if you are interacting with the DMV in your state, and some states broaden it out, you're registered unless you don't want to be. Yeah. And it's adding a lot of people, it costs less, and, and uh, it, it's, it, it's a real game changer if, if it really takes hold. So much, so much to be paying attention to on November 6th after the polls close and before that, but so many exciting opportunities. Um, so speaking of the midterms, lots of things we're talking about have, you know, a long arc of change. <laughs> but We've got a two week arc. Right, but like if we, if we you know, anxiety. besides supporting the work in your state or in other states, there's lots of ways to participate in the ballot initiatives from out of state that people can find online. We can share some on Facebook but lots of ways to participate in Florida Second Chances and in the Michigan Ballot Initiative from, even if you don't live in those states, and if you live in those states, especially important to go and vote and help others. But um, are there things that people should be doing to make sure votes count 
on the 6th and leading up to the 6th. Well, you're right that there are things, first of all, that can be done uh, outside, even if you don't live in Florida, for example, in New York, there's phone banking yep. uh, or, or postcard writing and all that kind of thing, just the same as people are doing for campaigns. Yep. Um, there are things we can all do to make sure that the election is free and fair uh, and as much as possible free from abuse. One of these areas has to do with election security and making sure that the Russians don't hack the election or anybody else for that matter who's not Russian but uh, we know that we know that they attacked our democracy in 2016 yeah. we know that it didn't just involve stealing emails uh, we know that it included everything from breaking into the voter registration databases mm -hmm. to breaking into the software companies that do the vote counting and trying to break into the voting machines that we think we don't think that that happened but you don't really know, but it doesn't seem like it did. But the Trump administration's director of national intelligence said the warning lights are blinking red mm -hmm. about hacking and abuse in this election. And so what can we do? Well, it, the, the, anybody who follows these voting issues, and Credo's been involved with this mm -hmm. for years, knows so some of the basic stuff that we've all said about how to fix the voting machines. We need paper records, backup paper ballots, and there shouldn't be touchscreen machines without a paper record. There need to be audits after the fact and other things like that. Now, Congress actually provided almost $400 million this year for states to buy new voting machines. A lot of states haven't right. done it. It's too late for yes. two weeks from now, but we at the Brennan Center have put together basically a kit for activists and citizens. What you can do to put pressure on your local official to make sure they're ready. Mm -hmm. Do they have backup paper ballots? Do they have a plan for what happens on election day if there's some shenanigans that go on? Yep. Um, it's very local. We have, as you know, thousands of counties yep. really run the elections. That's, right. That's something where citizens can be right away, uh, you know, vigilant beforehand. On election day itself, there are all kinds of efforts, including the um, election protection hotline mm -hmm. that uh, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights organizes with a lot of other civil rights and voting rights groups. People can sign up. Uh, they have to be trained, but they can sign up to be helping yep. uh, answer the phones on those hotlines. And then there are on Election Day, too, that often the political parties and campaigns need bodies. They need people there at the polls to just watch and make sure that there isn't vigilanteism, there aren't people yep. trying to stop other people from voting. Yep. Also, things that you can find resources for. You can find them with you guys online, and with Credo. <laughs> so our website is is uh, the the Brennan www.brennancenter.org. Yep. And we do have real uh, you, you, news you can there. use for people. Great. Um, and and of course, everybody should should themselves vote. Right. It, Everyone should themselves vote. Well, the answer to the money is to vote. The answer to the voter right. suppression is to vote. to vote. It's to get your friends to vote. It's it's to make our voices heard. And you know, everybody says, "Oh, this election, this is the one that's really important. It's the most." But this one really, really, really is it really, really important. Really is. If if uh, if we can speak in a response to the abuse of power and the authoritarian impulses of this current administration, it will make a huge difference. And if Donald Trump is able to interpret what happened is just, oh, you know, everybody loves what I'm doing. Um, who knows what will happen the day after? That's right. <laughs> On that uplifting note, um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions for Michael? Yes, Brandy. Um, they want us to just restate the question, which could be you so, or me, but since no one can hear on Facebook. Oh, well, I, I'm happy to do it, or you can. Go so ahead. the question, as best I tell me if I'm mangling it, is um, in what ways 
uh, can we find hope in the legal system, especially given what has happened with the Supreme Court? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very challenging to topic and point because this Supreme Court has been really aggressively bad on democracy issues for several years now. And there are many things on which Justice Kennedy, the recently retired justice, uh, was the swing vote or even a positive force as on marriage equality. But uh, when it comes to, this is the guy who wrote Citizens United. Uh, and when it comes to voting rights or campaign finance, Justice Kennedy was not a swing vote. He was part of the hard right majority on the Supreme Court. But I don't want to minimize the change. I don't want to minimize what's happened. We now have, with Brett Kavanaugh sitting in that lifetime appointment on the court, something none of us really have lived with, certainly for our adult lives. We have a far-right, hard-right majority on the Supreme Court for the first time since the 1930s. And it's actually been the way it's been for a lot of the country's history. For a lot of the country's history, the courts and, and the Supreme Court were not a beacon of, of hope. They were actually a reactionary force. Um, whether it was in the Dred Scott decision or the period that lawyers call the Lochner era after one of the cases from the time where all the progressive era laws uh, setting uh, wage and hour standards, minimum wage, working conditions kept getting struck down because they violated the freedom of contract of people had to work, you know, seven days a week. Um, or the New Deal which was getting struck down by the Supreme Court uh, until the big fight with Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. So we can expect going forward that the courts themselves and their role and their anti-democratic role are going to become a bigger and bigger issue. And we all need to be shedding our illusions about the courts and speak truth about what they're doing if they really, if they really are, uh, are, are acting badly. I've seen public opinion surveys that showed that public approval of the Roberts court is higher among progressives than conservatives. And that's interesting. I mean, that was before Kavanaugh. I will say this, though. Up until now, on voting rights issues in particular, you had, starting around 2010, this wave of new voter suppression laws all across the country. 23 states, about half the half the country having these new laws to make it harder to vote for the first time in decades. Interestingly, they have been blocked over and over and over again by state courts and federal courts, by Republican judges and Democratic judges. Uh, th they uh, have understood that there is something basic and wrong if something is seen as uh, driven not by some technical voting question, but, but really by an attempt to keep people from exercising their rights. That's been the way it's been up until now. I want to see if that's still the case. And we all have to be putting as much um, up scrutiny on the Supreme Court. There will be probably some major voting rights cases in the next few years. Um, there haven't been in a, in a while. Uh, there will be another gerrymandering case that goes to the Supreme Court in the next year about North Carolina, which gerrymandered in a very racist way, as well as having a bunch of other terrible laws that have been often blocked. So there's a lot that's going to be at stake. And it's also the case, not to get all doom and gloom here, but um, you know, I mentioned that all these exciting ballot measures done by the voters. Uh, a number of the conservatives have argued that those are unconstitutional. It was actually a challenge to the Arizona Redistricting Commission a few years ago in the Supreme Court. It was such a nutty argument, I thought, that they would never even take the case. And they took the case. And while we prevailed, it was five to four. They said that it was uh, only legislatures could set voting rules. In other words, the people couldn't, even if in their state they have the power of the legislature with these initiatives. And, but it was five to four, and Justice Kennedy was in the majority. So nobody really knows where the votes are on that. And if the Supreme Court goes the wrong way on that, it would knock down dozens of state laws all over the country.
to strengthen democracy that have been enacted for a century. So I hope, it, I hope we never get to that point. But the courts are going to be a major terrain of, uh, uh, of conflict on these things going forward. That was a happy ending. Wow. <laughs> Does anyone have a question that they anticipate might have a happy ending that we should ask Michael before but, we're done? But I, I think we need to remember that these, those kinds of legal fights are not going to be won much. I'm a lawyer. I love the footnotes. You know, they're not going to be won with the briefs and the footnotes. They're going to be won in the court of public opinion. Mm -hmm. The right wing understood that for years. They've understood that you have to persuade the public, and then the courts will, they all live in the same country the rest of us live in. So we need to be yelling as loud as possible about these issues, and, and that will improve our odds in the courthouse. Maybe we should stop there. Stop there. <laughs> <laughs> I feel we'll, only we worried that we can, we can like go. Any other questions could lead us back into the, <laughs> to the doom, which is good to remember and sometimes good to but, you know, be it, out of. It's, it's the, I don't know if this is good or if this is good news or not good news, but it's, we, we've always had to fight about these issues. Yes. It's been a fight from the very beginning of the country, and maybe we would think it ought not be, but it has everything to do, as you said, with the changing demographics, yep. with the pa voice and power of women and others who want to be heard. And, and I, I, did, I wrote a book on the history of voting rights, and uh, it goes back to the very start, and that the, there were two strains at the beginning of the country's history. You know, at that time, of course, only white men who owned property right. were allowed to vote. And Pennsylvania had this sort of radical constitution that they wrote in 1776 that ended the property requirement uh, for voting for men. And Ben Franklin was the head of the, wrote the constitution in Pennsylvania. And he explained, he said, the, the, he told the story, he said, there's a man who owns jackass and it's worth fifty dollars so the man can vote and then the jackass dies the man is older and wiser and understands government better but the jackass is dead so the man can't vote so who really has the right to vote the man or the jackass <laughs> that was his explanation Everybody thought that seemed plausible but up in Massachusetts John Adams wrote their constitution and they said you ought to do the same thing Pennsylvania did and end the property requirement for voting and make wealth no longer the basis of voting. And he was aghast at that idea. He actually said this. He said, if we do that, women will demand the right to vote. Lads of 18 will demand the right to vote. Men who have not a farthing to their name will think themselves worthy of an equal voice in government, and they will demand the right to vote. He said, there will be no end of it. And that's exactly right. That's this whole story of the country. There is no end of it. It's this constant fight to make the democracy real for everybody. So it's not going to end, but no, that's OK. Yeah. That's what it means to be in the fight. Yeah. That's the happy ending. That's good. That's good. <laughs> um, um, thank you so much for being with us. Um, Michael um, also wrote several State of the Union addresses. <laughs> It occurred to me at some point that maybe he could just read one of those instead of talking to us about voting rights, but this was much better than... Uh, this was shorter than... Well, and shorter, I guess, too, but I was, I was like, I'm going to talk to someone who wrote a State of the Union address. That's exciting. But um, talking about voting rights is much better than Bill listening I, to a State of the Union from, from Bill Clinton's era. I was President Clinton's chief speechwriter, and he once introduced, once introduced me after one of those speeches as the person who typed the speech, so I, I wow. like this better. Wow, okay. Um, <laughs> So, it was accurate, but well, not the accurate story. but not inclusive, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for being here. Thanks to everyone on Facebook for joining. Thanks to everyone on the Credo team who was here, um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.